Hi guys, it is a nasty cold blah day here in the end times. And I'm going to pretend like it's Sunday, October 2nd. I'm actually going to be on the road on Sunday. But I want to go ahead and bring you my weekly doomsday sermon and put it out there on Sunday in which I look at my latest favorite Bible of the Apocalypse. And this one is for, I guess, about an apocalypse that has already happened, a former apocalypse. And this is this book, 1491. It's an excellent book that I highly recommend uh, you read. 1491, New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus uh, by this journalist named Charles C. Mann. Do understand that Charles Mann is not an anthropologist or an archaeologist or even a historian. He's a journalist, which being a sort of journalist myself, I think this is a good thing because um, he's an excellent writer. What's the description of this book? This is the second edition, so it's got it came out a couple of years ago. Charles C. Mann's groundbreaking work of science, history, and archaeology now expanded and updated in this new edition radically alters our understanding of the Americas before the arrival of Columbus in 1492. Contrary to what so many Americans learn in school, Columbus did not, no shit Sherlock, Columbus did not land in a sparsely settled near pristine wilderness. Recent research has shown that Indians arrived millennia earlier than previously thought and shaped the lands around them in ways that we are only now beginning to understand. The astonishing Aztec capital had running water and immaculately clean streets and was larger than any contemporary European city. There's several people who are now believing that the population of the New World was in fact a lot bigger than Europe itself in 1492. Uh, native cultures created corn in a specialized breeding process that has been called man's first feat of genetic engineering. <clears throat> Perhaps most surprising, many researchers believe that past Indian cultures actually created much of today's Amazon rainforest. This is a transformative new look at a rich and fascinating world we only thought we knew. And guys, I want to make it abundantly clear, as Charles Mann makes it clear, Charles Mann is no eco-Nazi. I wouldn't even necessarily call him an environmentalist. Uh, this is not uh, and, and so much an environmentally apocalyptic book as just the, the unbelievable carnage that, uh, that Columbus, the genocidal carnage that Columbus and his ilk brought to the New World, um, it's, it wasn't guns, germs, and steel that brought down the Native Americans. It was germs. It was smallpox uh, that a lot of this book, the first half of this book, talking about, uh, you know, some estimates going as high as there could have been 100 million people living here when Columbus got here, and as much as guns and steel uh, added to the carnage, it was smallpox. 
hands down how these globe and well from the Indians perspective this global pandemic uh, how it estimates as high as 97 percent of uh, whether you want to call them Indians or Native Americans just just brought down uh, by by smallpox, you know, from Canada to Tierra del Fuego. Uh, that is a lot of what this book is about. Anybody who does not understand global pandemics might want to go talk uh, to some Indians. Anywho's, uh, good lord guys, this book is over 400 pages this sweeping epic looking at all of these, uh, this newest research coming on in, in the last 30 or 40 years uh, from New England to the Amazon jungle, just, just laughing off um, some of uh, the ridiculous notions we've had about uh, about Indians uh, that we were taught in high school and but the bottom line here guys is these the the main thesis uh, of this book is if, if there is anybody suffering any delusion that Native Americans particularly those uh, in in the United States what's become the U.S. north of the Rio Grande River and in the Amazon jungle were some sort of noble savage living in balance and harmony with Mother Earth. Uh, let Charles Mann uh, tell you one thing. This, this book, 1491, forever lays to rest that absolutely unadulterated horse shit notion uh, that, that Indians had no effect on, 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 on the land north of the Rio Grande River and in the Amazon jungle. And I think anyone agrees, uh, looking at the Mayas, the Aztecs, and the Incas, uh, you have to throw it out the window uh, about how they lived in balance with this planet. Interestingly, uh, Charles Mann does not seem to buy into the overkill hypothesis that it was Native Americans. He talks about it a lot. He personally is not convinced, as I am, uh, about the overkill uh, hypothesis that it was Indians <clears throat> that, that it was Indians that were responsible for the megafaunal extinctions uh, about 13,000 years ago um, which I really don't understand. If I, I might get around to talking about that, but I'm going to jump to the close to the very end of this book. Good, good Lord, guys, I, I could dive in anywhere in this book. But what he's talking about after he he says that he's not convinced that it was it, it was the Indians that wiped out all of these megafauna and pretty much had turned what later became the United States pretty much into a waste biological wasteland before Honky even got here. I, I really was, because I, even I, who do agree with the overkill hypothesis, in which many people, anybody with a brain still agrees with, even I had never uh, jumped to this conclusion that more and more um, archaeologists, anthropologists, biologists are, are coming to 
uh, to understand um, let's see <clears throat> let me dive in it's trying to find anywhere to dive into this just to give you a taste of this book at the time of Columbus the Western Hemisphere had been thoroughly painted with the human brush whether or not you believe in the overkill hypothesis Agriculture occurred in as much as two-thirds of what is now the continental United States with large swaths of the southwest terraced and irrigated. Among the maize fields, the corn fields in the Midwest and Southeast, mounds by the thousands stippled the land. The forest of the eastern seaboard had been peeled back from the coast which were now lined with farms when Columbus got here. Salmon nets stretched across almost every ocean-bound stream in the Northwest, and almost everywhere there was Indian fire. <coughs> he spends one chapter talking about how, how Indians uh, had been using fire to radically transform the landscape they found when they got here uh, all over the United States and, and all over the Western Hemisphere using fire uh, to transform the land. Um, and then he talks about uh, just, just the complete transformation of the land uh, in the Aztecs, Maya, and, and Peru. Uh, and all of this had implications for wildlife populations. Talking about the wildlife populations that early Europeans found talking about these 60 million bison you know all of the everything from the bison to the salmon even the passenger pigeon uh, that that it was all of these Native Americans from the Amazon jungle to Canada uh, had implications for animal pop the animal populations that the early Europeans found um, and talking about uh, all, all of the, the maize-based, the corn-based agriculture that had spread from Mexico all the way to Canada uh, by the time Honky get here, got here, for obvious reasons, farmers, meaning the Native American farmers, did not relish the prospect of buffalo herds trampling through their cornfields. Nor did they want deer, moose, or passenger pigeons eating the maize. They hunted them until they were scarce around their homes. But at the same time, they tried to encourage species to grow in numbers farther away where they would be useful. Um, this is interview with uh, somebody, some, I don't know, Professor Woods, quote, the total number of bison seems to have gone down quite a bit uh, uh, under the Indians. And so when disease, namely smallpox, brought to the U.S., by honky swept the Indians away from the land, this entire ancient regime that the Indians had created before honky ever got got here collapsed. 
and for some evidence of this, Hernando de Soto's expedition staggered through the southeast for four years in the early 16th century and saw hordes of people, but apparently did not see one single bison. No account describes them, and it seems unlikely that chroniclers would have failed to mention sighting such an extraordinary beast. So more than a century later, after smallpox had cleared out the humans, um, the French explorer La Salle canoed down the Mississippi, and where De Soto had found prosperous cities, La Salle encountered what, quote, a solitude unrelieved by the faintest trace of man. Everywhere the French encountered bison, quote, grazing in herds on the great prairies which then bordered the river. <clears throat> when the Indians died, the shaggy creatures vastly extended both their range and their numbers, according to Valerius Geist, a bison researcher at the University of Calgary. Quote, uh, the post-Columbian abundance of bison was largely due to Eurasian diseases, namely smallpox, that g decreased the Indian hunting of the bison. The massive thundering herds that uh, the early Euro Europeans, as they moved in to these depopulated lands, uh, were pathological, something that the land had not ever seen before and was unlikely to, say, to see again. The same may, may have held true for many other species. This is Charles K., wildlife ecologist at Utah State. Quote, if elk were here in great numbers all this time, the archaeological sites should be chock full of elk bones. But the archaeologists will tell you the elk were not there. Close quote. In middens around Yellowstone National Park, uh, they first show up in large numbers about 500 years ago, the time of the great epidemics. Uh, until European contact, the coastline of California was heavily populated, according to William Preston, geog geographer, uh, geographer at California State Polytechnic University, said, but after Columbus, everything changed. The Indian population collapsed, and voila, clams and mussels exploded in numbers. They also grew larger. Game overran the land once there were no Indians to kill them. No shit, Sherlock. Sir Francis Drake sailed into San Francisco Bay in 1759 and saw a land of plenty. Quote, infinite was the company of very large and fat deer, he announced. How could he have known that just a century before the shoreline had been thickly settled with humans and the deer were much more scarce? And then, of course, he, he mentions that not everyone is swallowing this. Don't worry, there's plenty of native... Uh, there's still plenty of noble savage uh, lovers out there, but getting back to his his thesis, when the newcomers uh, moved west, they were preceded. So when the Europeans moved west, they had been preceded by a wave 
of disease and then a wave of ecological disturbance. Uh, this is historian Stever, Stephen Pine. Uh, the virgin forest was not encountered in the 16th and 17th centuries. It was invented in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. By 1800, the hemisphere was thick with artificial wilderness. If, quote, forever primeval means woodland unsullied by human presence, uh, there was much more of it in the 19th century than the 17th. So uh, th this makes absolute sense to me. So I, I don't understand. I, I, you know, uh, this fellow Charles Mann, he, he's careful to be an objective journalist and, and, not to, and not to say which one of these theories that, that he personally believes, but it is clear that, that he believes uh, that, that Indians had a tremendous uh, effect uh, on bison numbers and elk numbers and salmon numbers and, 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 and even uh, passenger pigeon numbers. So, so why doesn't he uh, go for the overkill hypothesis? Uh, but I'm not. I'm, I'm not going to get in a rant into the overkill hypothesis here. Uh, I've had plenty of rants uh, about why I uh, think it is a no-brainer. Uh, what was the cause of the megafaunal extinction in, in North America. It was the same damn cause of the megafaunal extinction in Madagascar, New Zealand, Easter Island, and anywhere else humans have come into contact uh, with an ecosystem that did not have humans in it before. It, it is immediately butchered and turned into an environmental wasteland. But I wanted uh, to get a lot to get around to uh, uh, Charles C. Mann talking about the collapse of the Mayan. Uh, so, why did the Maya abandon all their cities? Um, quoting this Mayan archaeologist David Webster, no words are more calculated to strike dismay in the hearts of Mayan archaeologists. Uh, you know, <clears throat> One reason Webster avoids the question is its scope. Asking what happened to the ancient Mayas is, is like asking what happened in the Cold War. The subject is so big that one hardly knows where to begin. At the same time, that very sweep is why the Maya collapse has fascinated archaeologists since the 1840s, when the outside world first learned of the abandoned cities in Yucatan. Today, we know that the fall was not quite as rapid, dramatic, and widespread as earlier scholars believed. Uh, how, nevertheless, it was unique in world history. Cultures rise and fall, but there is no other known time when a large-scale society disintegrated and was replaced by Nothing but the Maya heartland did just that. What happened? Uh, so in the 1930, 1930s, uh, Sylvanus Morley of Harvard, probably the most celebrated Mayanist of his day, espoused what is still the best known theory to this day. 
uh, no shit Sherlock, the Maya collapsed because they overshot the carrying capacity of their environment. They exhausted their resource base, began to start to die of starvation and thirst, and fled their cities en mass, leaving them as silent warnings of the perils of ecological hubris. Uh, since Morley's day, scientific measurements, mainly of pollen and lake sediments, have shown that the Maya did, in fact, cut down much of the reason, region's forest using the wood for fuel and the land for agriculture. The, lar the loss of tree cover would have caused large-scale erosion and floods, and with their fields disappearing beneath their feet in a growing population to feed, Mayan farmers were forced to exploit ever more marginal terrain with ever more intensity. The tottering system was vulnerable to the first good push which came in the form of a century-long dry spell that hit Yucatan between about 800 and 900 AD. Social disintegration followed soon thereafter. Um, and this theory has been recounted in numberless articles and books, and the Maya collapse has become an ecological parable for green activists, along with the Pleistocene overkill, in, uh, which was not limited to North America, as some people erroneously believe. It was all over the Western Hemisphere, the Pleistocene overkill. It is a favorite cautionary tale about surpassing the limits of nature and following the implications of the Maya fall uh, that this Mayan uh, historian Clive Ponting asks, are contemporary societies any better at controlling the drive toward ever greater use of resources and heavier pressure on the environment? Is humanity too confident about its ability to avoid ecological disaster, close quote? The history of these Indians pointing and others have suggested has much to teach us today. Um, and then, then he goes from there to the, uh, to the noble savage. Curiously though, environmentalists also describe Native American history as embodying precisely the opposite lesson, how to live in a spiritual balance with nature. Bookstore shelves groan beneath the weight of titles like Sacred Ecology, Guardians of the Earth, Mother Earth, spiritual, spirituality, blah, blah, blah. Good Lord, am I already up to 30 minutes? So I just need to, I'm going to finish out this little chapterette and wrap it up. So strongly endorsed is this view of Native Americans that checklists exist to judge whether books correctly depict the their environmental values. Mostly they're talking about the North American and the Amazon Indians' uh, questionable environmental values. Uh, it's, I need to jump, a, jump ahead here for since I've hit my 30 minutes. Indians as poster children for eco-catastrophe on the one hand, and then we have 
Indians as green role models. The two images contradict each other less than they seem. Both are variants of the idea that Indians were, were suspended in time, touching nothing and untouched themselves like ghostly presences on the landscape. Uh, the first two sections of this book were devoted to different ways that re researchers have recently repudiated this perspective, this uh, noble savage perspective. Um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then, so in, in this last part of the book, he looks at the idea that native cultures did not or could not control their environment, the horseshit notion. Uh, the view that Indians left no footprint on the land is one obvious example of this, uh, of this horseshit. That they marched heedlessly to tragedy is a subtler one. Both depict indigenous people as passively accepting whatever is meted out to them whether it is in the fruits of undisturbed ecosystems or the punishment for altering them. Native Americans' interactions with their environments were as diverse as Native Americans themselves, but they were always the product of a specific historical process. Occasionally, researchers can detail that process with some precision, as in the case of the Maya. More often, one can see only the outlines of history, as in the, reconfig the, the ecological reconfiguration of the eastern United States. These two paradigmatic examples are the subjects I turn to now. In both of them, Indians worked on a very large scale, transforming huge swaths of the landscape for their own ends, sifting through the evidence it is apparent that many, though not all, Indians were superbly active land managers. They did not live lightly on the land. No shit, Sherlock. And uh, just real quickly, uh, he goes on to uh, add the, just to remind people about all the wars that were going on in the uh, Mayan civilization before the collapse, saying that it is always a combination when you're looking at civilization collapses between environmental factors and social factors, never-ending war being uh, one of the prime candidates for the collapse of civilization. It is environmental and social. But anyway, uh, I gotta wrap up this week's Doomsday Sermon. But uh, it's great read, guys. And anybody suffering from the noble savage myth needs to read 1491 New Revelations of the Americas Before Columbus. The bottom line being, nobody knows, nobody ever will know uh, what the hell went on in this country before Honky ever got here. That, that is really the, the bottom line of this book. But it's a fun read nonetheless. Bye, guys.